And good evening. Welcome to the midweek service. Thanks for joining us tonight. Great to have you with us. As we begin, let me just remind you, a lot of things happening here at the church, a lot of things going on. Please be mindful of those things. Uh, don't forget, our, our verse for this month is 1 Corinthians 3.10. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. We're starting a series of verses in 1 Corinthians 3. All of our memory verses uh, for each month through this year have to do with building because of our theme, let us rise up and build. And so this is the verse. Start memorizing it. And over the next few months, we'll be ver memorizing verses uh, 10, 11, 12, 13, maybe 14. I'm not sure. I have to go back and look at my notes on that. But do keep in mind, 1 Corinthians 3.10, that is the verse for the month. Also, uh, some other church announcements. Golden Agers, don't forget, next week, next Thursday, a week from tomorrow, Golden Agers will be meeting at the Epicurean. And keep that in mind, meeting there for lunch at 11 a.m. July the 15th. Make plans to be a part of that. And Sunday, I was asked to make the announcement that those who come will get a free dessert. So don't forget that. Free dessert uh, with, your, uh, with your meeting on that day. So keep that in mind and look forward to um, uh, a good time of fellowship. Also next week, we'll be running our second of our summer five-day clubs. It will be here at the church in a grassy area over beside the office. Listen, we need you to bring children. If you have children, have grandchildren, bring them to the five-day club. Looking forward to a great time there and make plans to be a part of it. That's next Monday, Monday through Friday of next week from 10 a.m. till noon. And so make plans to be a part of that. A lot of things going on. The week after that, our youth will be going to the Arise Youth Conference with C.T. Townsend up in Pigeon Forge. And that'll be an exciting time, an enjoyable time for them. And uh, we want you to make plans, have your young people be a part. If you have any questions on that, be sure and uh, contact Angie. She'll be able to answer those questions. Also, uh, let me thank those of you that have helped as our young people have been raising funds for this to help offset some of the expenses. And so make plans uh, to uh, pray for them as they're gone. And uh, thank you for all the help that you have been to them. Great to have you in this, uh, with us for the service tonight. As we begin, let me just bring our prayer requests before you and keep these in mind. First of all, we have a couple of praises. I mentioned these on Sunday. Uh, both Carrie Brown and Deborah Dunn, who had uh, some testing done, both have come back uh, clear of cancer. So we're praising the Lord for that. Sharon had let us know about Carrie and then had a chance to speak to Deborah and and Betty, so be praying for them, but praise the Lord for that. Uh, Ruth Delzell is continuing her treatments. Be praying for her. Be praying for Eddie Rogers and, of course, Karen as she looks after him and cares for him. He is home, but he continues uh, to need to be strengthened and make progress. Uh, also, you see Steve Vaughn. Steve was, uh, has uh, had some back injury as a result of being uh, hit uh, when he was driving, when he was turning into work, got rear-ended. And so do be praying for him as he'll be going to an orthopedist and looking at what needs to be done procedurally to give him some relief. So those are some of our prayer requests. If you have others, please let the church office know so that we can get those on the prayer list each week. Uh, our missionary of the week is Travis Snowd. Brother Travis and Terry Snowd, they serve in the United Kingdom. And so uh, do be praying for them and the work that they have going. Now, this week, I gave, I'm giving you a trivia. This, our trivia involves, uh, more specifically, our missionary and their work. But some of my trivia just seems to be so easy. You're getting it so quickly. Now, this one, I believe, is going to kind of require maybe a two-step process for you to get the answer. And so, hopefully, it'll make your work just a little more. But uh, this is your trivia for this week regarding Travis and Terry Snowd. The Snowds are currently establishing Downton Baptist Church in Southeast London and planting Headgate Baptist Church in Colchester, Essex. Okay? How far apart 
are the churches in miles be specific now what that's going to entail you're going to need to come up with the address of the church put it into a, a google maps or something get directions and see what it gives you distance wise and so we'll see how you do on that and of course some map programs you might get a little variation in distance but it'll be pretty close round it to the nearest mile and uh, that is your trivia, okay? Well, how far is it between the two church plants that the Snodes are working on, Downton Baptist Church and Headgate Baptist Church? See how you do on that, and let's see, make you work just a little more. By the way, thanks to those that always seem to look up the trivia. You can text it to me on my phone when you get that answer. But that's our trivia for the week. Let's have a word of prayer. We'll get into our study tonight and look into God's Word. Father, we do come to you tonight and we thank you for the opportunity we have to hold your Word and to study it and to read it. Uh, Lord, we, we come with grateful hearts for that opportunity, but we also know that as we come together, there are others that we need to pray for. We have those who are in our church family that are uh, dealing with illnesses or recovering from procedures or looking toward procedures. I pray you'll provide wisdom for doctors, provide healing. Lord, we certainly rejoice with those who have uh, received good reports and clear uh, prognoses here in recent days. I pray you'll continue to strengthen and encourage them. Uh, Lord, our missionaries of the week are the Snowds, and we, ble we ask you to bless their work there in the UK. We ask you'll give them fruit for their labor. I pray that you'll give them uh, strength and health as they work in the field and meet the needs that they have. And we'll thank you for that. Lord, bless our time together as we look into your word. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Take your Bibles, if you would, be finding Romans chapter 12. We're going to be looking at two passages of Scripture. And I'll go ahead and tell you this about the Bible study tonight. It's a little bit of an amalgamation between the series I've been teaching this month in uh, Life Group and then what I'm doing and the, the author of the book of 1 Peter. It kind of puts the two together and kind of melds them. And we're going to look at two passages of Scripture tonight in our time. You'll notice the topic I've given it is caution, Christian under construction. Uh, if you've been driving over these last several months now through the 75, uh, 24 interchange there, you'll notice they have these signs up. And as you're getting close, and there'll be signs up overhead. And it'll warn you it's a construction zone and encourage you to slow down and to be careful. And there are unusual lane changes. Uh, a little while back when they made the swap so that to go north on 75, you needed to be in the left lanes. And to go west on 24, you need to be in the right lanes. That created some concern concerns and some erratic driving from some of our folks as they were kind of learning the new traffic pattern and I still remember seeing some do that in fact just today I was coming through there and saw someone as they were negotiating that and evidently they had not been through since that change had been made and suddenly I saw them go from the extreme left-hand lane over two lanes of traffic so that they didn't miss the I-75 north uh, or the I-24 uh, west uh, ramp. And so a lot is going on, and, and, and you see those things. But they're because of the work that's being done, they caution you and say, be careful, there's construction going on here. Sometimes if you're around where there's building construction, I was headed into a business just the other day, and they were, they had, were doing some work on the on the facade on the front of the building and where you went into that particular store they had taken plywood and built a tunnel so that as you walked through you would be safe but still they had the signs up caution they had fences up so that you wouldn't wander into a place where someone might drop a hammer or something and injure you and so when you're around construction there are warnings there are cautions there's an alertness that is needed and so when we think of the Christian life, can I tell you, we as Christians are also under construction, and it's a work that's being done. Uh, this past Sunday morning, as we were starting into our series, we looked at Romans chapter 12, and we looked at verse 
2 and I call your attention to it tonight as a little bit of a just kind of a lead in to what I'm going to share with you and a pretty simple thought for you this evening this is Romans 12 2 many times we put the two verses together but look at just verse 2 it says and be not conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your minds that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. As, apost- as the apostle Paul is writing here, the challenge that he's giving to these believers is that they would be becoming more like Christ. And notice what he gives them. He says, first of all, he says, don't be conformed to this world. You see that word conformed there. You've heard me explain it and talk about it. It's the idea, don't pattern your life after this world. It's almost the idea of being pressed into a mold so that when you peel off that mold, you look like the imprint of it. I put a little word here with it. Don't be, don't be fashioned after. Uh, Some have suggested, I think we suggest that it's almost the idea of a masquerade. If you ever go to a masquerade party, they have have a little mask that they wear uh, when they go to those or that they'll hold up in front of their face on a stick when they go to those. He said, don't masquerade like this world. Don't make your outward appearance, your outward goals, your ambitions, your pursuit, your ideals of success, all those things. Don't fashion those after this world. Or in other words, after that old man that you were before you became a believer. But, he goes on to say, be transformed. I'm sure you've heard people talk about this word and the fact that it's, we get our word from it, metamorphosis. That transformation that takes place uh, that results in that butterfly. And so it, it it's that idea and really you could maybe write the word above that that means it has to be the be transfigured to be transfigured like when Jesus went up on the mountain with the disciples and he was transfigured he was changed before them don't be fashioned after this world but be transfigured and the way this happens is it happens by the renewing of your mind Now, I call your attention, so much of this previous part of the first part of the verse has to do with the outward. The change he's talking about is something that comes from the inward. This renewing is is the idea of a gradual transforming. A gradual transforming of your mind, of your thought processes of your philosophy, of your worldview, of your goals, of your ambitions. Be transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. When we were starting this past week, and and for those of you that were part of the life group, I apologize, this was not be a total redundancy of that lesson but one of the slides that I showed in class was a slide that had to do with sanctification and it gives this little statement for you sanctification is the process now get this it's the process whereby the spirit of God takes the word of God and changes us to become like the son of God I use the analogy I just my one of my nieces just had a baby last Friday and uh, he, when he was born I got to see pictures of the baby and and oftentimes people ask me you know that when you see a new baby who does he look like or what side of the family and I never can tell because to me just babies look like babies but as you grow you begin to look more like your family you get uh, you get Uh, You take on family characteristics, family resemblances, uh, maybe from your mother's side of the family, from your dad's side of the family, whatever. You begin to take on those family resemblances. Well, the same thing's true in the work of sanctification. What happens is we are changed as the Spirit of God begins to work in our lives through the Word of God 
so that we should become to take on become to take on a family resemblance so that we start to look more like Jesus now it doesn't happen all at once it is a process some will call that that progressive sanctification where we progressively become or gradually become more like Christ as I was thinking of that my mind went to the Apostle Peter Simon Peter and it went back to a particular encounter that he had with Jesus where I think Jesus was emphasizing this to him we've been looking and studying we just started preaching through the book of first Peter on Sunday mornings and we've talked about the fact that when you get to first Peter he's now in his 60s he was saved in his late 20s maybe 27 28 years old right in there when he got saved he became a follower of Jesus <clears throat> But there were many times when his old ways, his old nature kind of rose up, whether it, was, whether it was his vocalness, whether it was his denying the Lord, whatever it was, many times those things rose up because he was still going through that process, that change, and that grace taking hold in his life. Now when he writes the book of 1 Peter, we see that he's now 35 years down the road of this Christian life and that that depth that family resemblance has taken hold in his life and he's looking more like Christ his mind thinks more like Christ his responses are more like Christ and now he is writing to a new generation of believers and challenging them to find that grace of God sufficient in their trials and in their difficulties so that they can come through those times and be Christ like that's what was working and that's what's happened in the life of Simon Peter now the verse that we want to look at in the passage we we'll look at is found back in Luke chapter 22 so look to go back to Luke chapter 22 we'll begin in verse 31 and we'll kind of follow this through <clears throat> verse 31 the context of Luke 22 uh, most of you will be familiar for this this is leading into the arrest of Jesus where where Jesus is getting ready to be taken a prisoner tried unjustly and the next I say the next day it'll be the same day because it's evening and they count their days as evening and then day evening and morning is how the Jews would follow their day six o'clock in the evening would begin the next day for right now for right now in their minds this would be Thursday instead of Wednesday and so that's where he is in this conversation familiar passage of scripture it says the Lord said Simon Simon behold Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat but I have prayed for thee that thy faith fell not now and I always like to point this out because there's such great truth in here for you to notice the first notice the word you Jesus is speaking to Simon but one of the reasons he's speaking to him is understand and we talked about this I think two weeks ago in the in the service whenever you see the list of disciples there'll be different orders and sometimes they'll be called by different names but every time all through the Gospels when you see the listing through the Gospels and even Acts when you see the uh, the disciples and apostles mentioned Simon Peter's always mentioned first Jesus understood him to be the leader of this group and so when he addresses him while he addresses him he's also speaking on what's going to happen to this group of disciples notice the use and I have pointed out to you he says behold Satan hath desired to have you we use you for both singular and plural second person in in Shakespearean writing in this era when our Bible was written they would use you for plural and thee or thou for singular later it kind of evolved a little bit for formality and less but that's the way that they would use it so when Jesus says Satan hath desired to have you he's talking to Simon Peter but he's talking to him as far as all the group and he's saying Simon I want you to understand this Peter I want you to understand this 
Satan wants to sift all of you. You and the band of disciples, Satan wants to take you and he wants to pummel you and, and, and destroy you. Satan longs to sift all of you. But just so you know, I've prayed for thee. You see, the thee that you have there is singular. In other words, what Jesus is saying to the disciples, hey, Satan wants to have all of you and sift you. But just so you know, I have prayed for every one of you. I've prayed for you individually. He says to Peter here, Peter, I have prayed for thee. Now, he goes on to say, what has he prayed for thee? That thy faith fail not. Now, what's going to happen that night? Peter's going to deny the Lord. We see that as he tells him down the, later in this passage, he's going to deny the Lord. That thy faith fail not. And then he says, he says, that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted. Now, you see that word converted? It, it literally has the idea of turning back again. Peter, I don't want your faith to completely fail. You're going to go through some rough hours. The next 24 hours are going to be some of the darkest days of your life. But Peter, when you get turned back around, strengthen the brethren. You see, in this passage, Jesus was mindful of the fact Peter still had some growing to do. That progressive sanctification, that, that process that was taking place whereby the Spirit of God takes the Word of God and changes us to become like the Son of God. Not all of that has taken place, fully taken place in Simon Peter's life. And so Jesus, mindful of that, he says, when thou art converted. Then he tells him, strengthen thy brethren. They are going to need you. As you begin to take on more of that resemblance of me, as you grow, as you are transformed, as your mind is renewed, as you, as you are turned back again, you are going to be a strengthening help to the brethren. Strengthen thy brethren. He, Peter, said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. Now, at this point, Peter's, and he's in this bold moment. He says, Lord, I'll follow you. If it's to prison or if it's to die, I will follow you. But he's not really ready yet. He thinks he is, but he's not ready yet. Jesus responds by saying to him, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before that thou hast, shalt thrice deny thou knowest me. So you see here at the end of it, here's what Jesus said. Hey, Simon Peter, the work is going on, but you're still not quite to that family resemblance stage. Tonight, you are going to falter. Not once, not twice, not three times. Uh, not once, not twice, but three times. You're going to deny that you even know me. But remember what he said earlier? But when thou art converted, as this transformation takes place in your life, you're going to be a help. Strengthen thy brethren strengthen the others that's the message the sanctification the process whereby the spirit of god takes the word of god and changes us to become like the son of god remember after jesus was resurrected there were times when it was says and the angels said when they came to the tomb he's not here as he said the word of god as he said all through this point because it's the Spirit of God taking the Word of God changing us to make us like the Son of God that is the process that God wants to do in all of our lives be not conformed to this world be transformed by the renewing of your minds 
that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, what can we take with us from this idea of that work that should be taking place in us as we mature and become more like Christ and, he, and more and more we should look like him and act like him and think like him? What are some things we can take with us from this? I wrote three things down. Take a, maybe take a pen and write that we can take with us. Number one, spiritual transformation is a continuing process. Spiritual transformation is a continuing process. I'm sure all of you have figured this out. You never arrive in the Christian life. It's always a journey. There's always growth that's needed. There are always areas that we need to shore up. There are always stumbles that we need to deal with. There are always places where things sidetrack us from what we ought to do. There are always perhaps times when our, when our minds begin to think more like the world or maybe our ambitions or our attitudes or our actions or maybe in a time when we're tired or at a time when we haven't been as well fed or it's time when we have quenched the spirit. Spiritual transformation is a continuing process. All of us need to grow. All of us need to, need to continue to build upon the foundation of our life and to grow and become more like, more like Christ. I was just in a situation yesterday. I was talking to a person and something and through it. And I just looked at the person and said, look, will you forgive me? Will you forgive me? I, I, I'm sorry I didn't handle that like the way you thought I should. Will you forgive me? I think it almost set them back for a moment, but the truth is we never should get too big to be able to say that. The spiritual, spiritual transformation is a continuing process. The second thing that we ought to take with us, and this kind of ties... What we've been looking at in life group, what we've been looking at tonight with what we've been talking about on Sunday morning, the second thing is trials are tests to evaluate our progress and growth toward Christ-likeness. You know what trials do? Trials test the depth or the practicality or the application of what we're learning to apply in our Christian life. How we're able to be patient when something doesn't go our way or be gracious when, when someone is abrasive. How we're able to do these things. Trials are tests to evaluate our progress and growth toward Christ-likeness. Sometimes God will allow you to go through challenges just so that you can see where you are. And by the way, as we've talked before, he never puts those into your life to, to make you look bad. He's not trying to make you fail. He wants to see you succeed. Trials and tests. Trials are tests to evaluate our progress and growth toward Christ-like. Number three, the third thing that I wrote down is this. Christ-likeness is ultimately rooted in Christ-like humility. Remember in Romans 12, 2, where it says, Be transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind. By the renewing of your mind, if you go back, to Philippians chapter 2 let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus how are we how does sanctification work there's a process a work that takes place on the inside of us including the renewing of our mind what is our model let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus and then as you look through the mind of Christ, it talks about how he became a servant. He humbled himself and became obedient unto even the death of the cross. Can I tell you this? Christ-likeness is ultimately rooted in Christ-like humility. 
when you look through Romans 12 and you follow on through that, that chapter and that passage, one of the things you'll find is, one of the things it talks about is talks about condescending. It's basically the humble, humbleness. It's like an adult allowing a child to lead them, lead them by the hand, like a child wanting to take and show you something. Christ-likeness is ultimately rooted in Christ-like humility. How are you doing in that tra- in that? in that transformation process in that sanctification process that change should be taking place so that I go from a from a baby to a mature Christian I go from a baby to taking on a family resemblance I begin to look like I begin to act like I begin to take on that family look how are we doing spiritual transformation is a continuing work trials and tests trials are tests to evaluate our progress and Christ likeness is ultimately Christ like humility let's make sure that we exercise that Christ likeness in dealing with our families in dealing with our friends in dealing with our church family in dealing with our co-workers in dealing with people out in the world Father, we thank you for the time tonight. We thank you for the opportunity we have to look into your word. I pray that you will take this and remind us that we all need to continue to grow. We all need to continue to mature. And as we do so, may our lives look more and more like Christ. Well, thank you for it. Bless the remainder of our week. Bring us together on Sunday. We ask this in Jesus' name.